Hello, everyone. Welcome to the V Brown Bag session here at the Melbourne V Mug. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, we're going to take the next 20 minutes and do a highly condensed version of the talk we did in Sydney, which was certainly more than 20 minutes. Uh, but we're going to try and fit this into 20 minutes. So the idea here is giving you a little bit of career development advice and looking at it from two different perspectives. One from a technical perspective, because we're all technologists and we like to hear that part of it, but also um, equally important or perhaps more important would be looking at this from the business perspective, and that's where Keith is going to come in and look at this more from a business perspective, right? Um, I've reiterated in a number of presentations, and I'll reiterate again in this presentation, that technology is important as a technologist, of course, right? But technology in a business context does not exist in and of for itself. Like, we don't implement technology for technology's sake. We implement technology because there's something that we want to do for the business or some enabler that we want to make possible, right? So that's why I think the business perspective that Keith is going to share is really, really important. Quick, real super quick introductions. Um, so this is me. And that's my Jeep in the Rocky Mountains, where I live. OK, cool. And that's Keith. And that is actually not Keith. That is a picture that he took here in Melbourne. right? So, um, And you guys will have, you, you can get copies of this afterwards. So don't worry about trying to capture uh, contact information or, or whatever. OK. All right, so let me just jump in on the technical side real quick. OK? Uh, so there is a theme for all the technologies that I'm going to talk about, and I'll give you practical examples of each of the technologies as we as we move through here, right? Because I want you guys to have some some useful takeaways from this, not just some, you know, vague, hey, you should look at this, but here are some specific examples that I would recommend that you look at. Um, but the overarching theme here is that the real value moving forward is in moving up the stack, right? We exist as employees, we exist as technologists to add value to the organization. Um, there is no value in clicking a button. Okay, anyone can click a button, right? The brand new college graduate earning, you know, maybe half of what you earn as a seasoned professional can be told to click a button. The, the real value for you is in what you're doing for the business, right? And so anything that we do to be more effective, more efficient, more productive for the business is where we add value. And that's why some of the tools that you'll hear me talk about are all about um, kind of multiplying what we're capable of doing, acting as force multipliers to make us more effective, capable of doing more. The reality is that there is no one in this room who is being told by their boss and by their organization, here, I'm going to let you do less with more. OK? <laughs> and if you are working for a company where your boss is telling you, don't worry, we're going to let you do less with more, I want to talk to you because that sounds like a real great place to work. Um, I don't know how long it'll last, but it sounds like a great opportunity, right? Instead, the, the reality is that we're all being asked to do more with less, right? So for, for you, moving forward from a technical side, right, it's all about efficiency, it's all about consistency, deterministic results, right? It's all about adding value to the business. Um, and these repetitive tasks that, that you're just doing over and over again, you know, building a Windows machine. Like, why are you wasting time installing Windows from scratch, right? That, that there's no value to the business in doing that. Right? You need to automate that. Um, so the technologies that I'm going to recommend that you investigate. And, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about each of these and give you some examples. So you heard a lot about containers and container, uh, container orchestration tools. Right? The reality is, and I'll do a, a, a quick poll here, even though it may not show up on the recording um, for the VBrand Fix. Who in here is, are running um, containers in production right now? OK, everybody look around. There are no hands, right? So you're probably thinking, Scott, why are you recommending we look at containers? Your job as a technologist adding value to the business is helping the business understand how can they most effectively solve the problems that they're having with technology. You can't answer that question if you don't know what the possible answers are, right? How can you properly advise the business about whether or not containers are a viable solution for a problem they're experiencing if you don't know how containers work or you don't know how container orchestration tools work, right? So we're talking about Docker, of course, uh, but that's not all. There's also other uh, container implementations, LXC, RKT from Rocket. On the orchestration side, there's the Docker ecosystem, Swarm, Machine, Compose. There's also Kubernetes, right? Um, these are tools that, at the very least, you need to understand what they do and why they do it so that you can begin to say, here are valid use cases within my organization that these um, technologies might be able to solve, OK? Second, public cloud providers and public cloud services. Now, again, more than likely, your boss, depending on how far up he or she is, is going to come to you at some point and say, uh, we need to move to the cloud, right? 
Um, and bef you know, before we just blindly say, you know, yes, ma'am, or yes, sir, or whatever it is, then we need to be able to say, okay, let's let's talk and about this. You know, what what are the workloads that make sense to run on the public cloud provider? What are the workloads that don't make sense? All right, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that all all workloads should move to the cloud. That might be, you know, at some point, yes, perhaps. I'm not going to sit up here and tell you that you should not move anything to the cloud because it's not secure. Whatever, right? There are challenges on either side. You decide you want to go all on premises. That's fine. There are advantages there. Um, there are also disadvantages. You decide you want to go all in on a public cloud provider. Fine. There are advantages there, and there are disadvantages, right? Um, and Keith's going to talk about some of that in his in his business side when he uh, focuses on a particular use case. So, um, but you know, the, as far as what are we talking about? They were talking about major, you know, the probably the, the big three, and then also since you're more than likely all VMware customers here at a VMware user group, then we would also consider uh, vCloud Air as, as an option for you to explore. Um, automation orchestration tools. Who in here is using configuration management tools like Puppet, Chef, Salt, Ansible? Two, three, okay. <laughs> that, is, that, is, uh, that is an amazing like, opportunity for all of you, right? Um, again, there's no value in, in manually building a web server, okay? There's, the business doesn't care. They just want the web server. So why waste your time, you know, manually installing IIS or Apache or Nginx or whatever it is that is your web server platform of choice? Use a tool, write the manifest or the playbook or, you know, the cookbook, whatever term you want to use, depending on your platform, automate it. And then move on to something that's more valuable, right? Um, there's just no value in doing that. Um, Scripting languages, right? Most of you probably have a significant uh, installed base of Windows in your environment. How many of you guys are taking some time to look at PowerShell? Okay, mm -hmm. a little more there. That's good. We're moving in the right direction, right? Automate these things. Don't don't keep doing the same stuff over and over again, right? Um, by the way, on the Windows side, PowerShell DSC, right? Desired state configuration. It's a configuration management tool for Windows, like Puppet, Chef, Salt, Ansible, which are primarily sort of more Linux based. Um, so those are things you need to look at. Cloud management, cloud orchestration platforms, right? Um, you know, yeah, everybody's saying, oh, you need to go to the private cloud, you need to build a private cloud, whatever. What does that look like? What does that mean? You really need some sort of or infrastructure orchestration service. And that could be a vRealize automation, it could be a homegrown solution with vRealize Orchestrator, it could be an open source solution like OpenStack. It doesn't really matter, right? But there's, there's not a whole lot of value <laughs> in the business for somebody to submit a, a help desk ticket and somebody on the back end to go create a VM. Uh, it, it, yeah. I mean, you know, let, let's move past that and talk about some higher level things like automating app installations and, and uh, bringing consistency to our platform so that we don't have to be, you know, strung up by inconsistency when we have an outage and it's supposed to be this way and instead it's that way, right? Because of a configuration drift. These are all the things where we can begin to add value because as humans, it's far better for us to use this up here to really solve complex problems rather than just click next, 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 done, okay? So, um, so these are kind of the things that, I'm, that, I'm, that, I, that I believe from a technical side if you can look at these, and these, these are all things that you can apply or investigate today in your infrastructure. This is not, I'm not saying you guys have to rip out what you got and implement something entirely new, all right? These are all things that you can implement today. You look at something like this in a configuration management tool, you've got operating system instances in your data center right now, right? You can apply a configuration management tool to manage the configuration of those operating system instances. And that's a quick, easy win. Doesn't require you to do a whole bunch of different stuff, right? So I'm gonna turn it over now to Keith to look at it from the business perspective. All right, punching it front end from the business side. So I'm a reforming, I'm not a reform yet, but I'm a reforming management consultant. So I have to do uh, use cases, business cases. Uh, that's just part of what I am right now and I'll reform afterwards. But I think it's useful for this conversation. What did I hear in Scott's presentation from a business perspective is what the industry is starting to now label as cloud native. Technologies listed are, you know what, whether we're talking about Ansible, Chef, uh, on a Unix, Windows, on a Unix, Nix side, Bash, Python, all of this stuff at the end of the day delivers business value from walking away from the commodity of clicking a button. You know, I shared this morning that I'm not allowed in the data center, but if you show me how to click a button, I can click a button. I'm, I can still do that, I have a button here. <laughs> but notice one of the things that Scott didn't mention, which is cost. You know, sometimes we can get caught up in the cost argument, whether it's, I did 
uh, session in Sydney about hyperconvergence. The advantage of hyperconvergence, no matter what the vendors tell you, is cost savings. No, it's cost shifting. The, your organization is going to spend the money, whether it's on CapEx, OpEx, unless you're a, a, in a certain kind of target demographic where you're literally getting rid of 10 people because you've, you've completely embraced hyperconvergence. There's not an awful lot of organizations that's going to do that. You're still going to have big iron. You're still going to have to talk to that big iron. And you're still going to need people smart enough to deliver value on, on those complex solutions and, and integrating those various stacks. So the use case I wanted to talk about specifically was the Netflix one. I don't know if you guys noticed a couple of weeks ago, Netflix put out a blog post talking about their journey to the cloud. They just completed it which was a shock to some of us because Netflix has been held up as this ultimate example of how you can move enterprise services to the cloud and everything's happy, cheaper, better. Well, Netflix didn't really find that to be the case initially. It took them seven years, <coughs> excuse me, to eventually move to the cloud. And I think from lessons learned, I learned two primary things from their solution. One, clouding, or I call it clouding is hard. And two, it takes an immense amount of resources to do so. And those resources morph. We talked this morning about the business drivers behind technology. One of the interesting things I found about Netflix's culture, you know, I talked about change, change, change. Netflix's job culture by default is to say, you know what, you are, let's say you're an automation engineer and we have all these, autom all these things that that's requires automation. You create a foundation for me, help me to get to the point where I can start automating stuff. And once that's done, your job is done. You're no longer a Netflix employee. Job well done, thank you. You have this great thing on your resume, go out and do something else. I think that's from a high level, I think that's the future of work. That we are going to start as engineers delivering sol solutions and we have to push the envelope. You know, I talked about pushing the envelope on the technical side. We also need to, oh, I'm sorry, I talked this morning about pushing the envelope on the technical side. I'm also talking about we need to push the solution on the business side. This is why I'm passionate about things, you know, other companies outside of VMware have similar solutions such as the VMUG Advantage program. We need these type of things to be able to put stuff like uh, vRealize in our labs and create these automation strips, scripts and configuration management things that work with things such as AWS. I gave the example of one of the big lessons learned from AWS's journey to the cloud in 2012 you know, Scott talked about Ansible and configuration management. What, how do you test for an elastic load balancer change that you don't have power over making that change or approving or stopping that change? Most of us are not Netflix. We can't call AWS up and say, you know what, I saw that you have scheduled maintenance on Wednesday. Don't do it. <laughs> the, Netflix could probably do that. Most of us don't have that type of uh, footprint where we can impact the maintenance schedule of Netflix. That means that we have to work around it. What happens when we start to spread our workloads across more than just AWS and we bring Google Compute into the uh, organization as well as Azure, we start to spread, uh, spread risk from a infrastructure perspective and a provider perspective, but we're making a much more difficult distributed system. I told you this technology, this adding business skill is a technology problem. It is still a technology problem. When you distribute risk, you make the technology solution much more complicated. From a practical sense, the way we add value to the business is that we learn these technologies that help us solve these business challenges. So when we say, when someone says, oh, why do you want to learn Ansible? so that when we move to the cloud or as we transition to a hybrid infrastructure, we don't put the business at risk. A lot of the things that we talked, that AWS talked about, or I'm sorry, Netflix talked about when it came to moving to the cloud, 
The least important thing was cost. On the top list was scale, agility, uh, and then, I'm sorry, scale and agility was the top two things. And then as a side benefit of agility, the fact that they replatformed all their applications to be elastic, they were able to design a solution that didn't, was not designed for peak usage, and therefore, they save costs. Instead of buying thousands of servers for peak, they can now scale up to 1,000 servers and then scale down when they don't need those 1,000 servers. That adds business value. So learning these technologies directly impacts the bottom line. Now, that's it for this version of this conversation. Me and Scott did a session at, in Sydney that's 40 minutes. I recorded it. I thought I recorded and casually put it on in a couple of weeks. Since we only had 20 minutes for this one, I'll most definitely, if you guys visit the website, www.thectoadvisor.com, within the next couple of days, I'll put that version up. It's a much more extended conversation. I go into a little bit more deeper detail in the Netflix use case, and Scott most definitely touches the technology piece at a, uh, at a deeper layer. Uh, I don't know if we had time for questions. <laughs>